Sabbath, you guys. Um, I want to take a step back to start with. To last week, briefly, we had a few questions on uh, the material in Daniel 8, which connects to what we're studying this week. Of course, the name of our study this week is what? Our prophetic message. So it's an exciting message, three angels' messages, and let's get started with a word of prayer. Our Father and our God, Lord, we thank you so much for the numerous blessings that you have bestowed upon us, including the blessing of the spirit of prophecy. Right now, Lord, as we speak, we ask that you would impress upon our hearts not our own thoughts or words or deeds, but the mind of Christ, that we may understand what things are to come to pass and what things have already taken place. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, last week, you remember, we were dealing with the eschatological day of atonement. And as I said, I just want to review a few things quickly. I'll go through uh, some of these slides rather quickly. You remember that there were, in Daniel 8, sanctuary beasts. The, uh, a building upon the vision in Daniel 7 and the dream in Daniel 2. This time, God uses beasts that are sanctuary-related because the focus is now coming into the sanctuary. And we talked about the little horn in particular in Daniel 8. And that little horn, uh, you know, was very upset and very arrogant. Puffed himself up even to the Most High God. And this little horn really, to be honest with you, was rather crazy. In Daniel 8.13 again, it says, I hear or I heard a certain saint or holy one speaking to another. And so this vision is dealing with a, something that uh, is audible or is heard. And uh, looks like somebody got a little accident. Just rub it, dear, and flex it a little bit. You should be okay. And so this vision that is being discussed has to do with what was heard. We'll get into that some more a little bit later. And this is just review, so I'm not going through this in great detail. But now, in Daniel 8.14, is when we get to what is called the 2300-day prophecy. So if you're in your Bibles, you can turn to Daniel chapter 8.14. And let's slow down a little bit. In Daniel 8.14, there's a question that takes place, and the question is, how long should all of these things be? In other words, all the things that took place in this vision, how long will it be? Now, we're going to understand shortly why it is that Daniel was asking that question. And it's a very, very important reason to be short with you. The reason why Daniel asked that question is because he thought he knew the time, but now he's second-guessing himself. We'll unfold that here in just a moment. So now the question is, well, what's going on here? It says, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. I want you to take a look at what happens in Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9 and verse 1, the Bible says, In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood, you see that word? He understood by books the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish the 70, what is that? 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. So get this. This is the 70 year prophecy in the book of Jeremiah. And Daniel is, remember, he just had this vision uh, perhaps not just had it, but the most recent vision that he had was of this 2300 evening mornings. And remember, the 2300 is dealing with some little horn that apparently is persecuting the people of God. He understands as an Israelite and a faithful one that the people of God are his people. And 
Yet, he is a student of Bible prophecy. He's a student of Jeremiah the prophet. And he understands that, wait a minute, we're supposed to be winding down our slavery to Babylon. And now this angel tells him, this heavenly being, tells him that there's 2,300 days. And trust me, he understood it was years. In, in order to, and the reason why I say that is because he's dealing with several you know, empires, and there's no way that those empires could last a literal 2,300 years. It's just, that's, I mean, 2,300 days, that's only a few years. At any rate, so Daniel's thinking in his head, must have been thinking, 70 years should be, we're coming up on the 70 year mark, why am I hearing about this 2,300 days? He cared about the freedom of his people. It's the first thing I want us to recognize. He was concerned about his people's return to God. He was concerned about the at one ment of his people and God. And now this vision is troubling him. I should have read the last part of uh, chapter 8. Let's take a look at it. Notice verse 26. It says, And the vision of the evening and the morning, that's the 2300, which was told is true, wherefore shut up thou the vision, for it shall be for days, in other words, many days. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick days. Afterward, I rose up and did the king's business. So notice he, this vision was so troubling to him that he got sick. So now, chapter 9, he understands the time is coming up, his people should be free, but what's going on with this 2300 days? He is really troubled by this vision. And so, uh, I want you to notice that God cares about his people. When he is worried, as he's worried about this, uh, his people and their freedom, God comes to him and gives him, gives him something, a message that will help him to deal with the troubling uh, part, portions of the 2300 day prophecy, namely that his people seems like they would still be in trouble. And uh, I didn't mean to change the slide just yet, but in Daniel 9, 24, remember he's troubled. What's going to happen? I thought my people were about to come to freedom. Let's take a look at 924, because now he hears about this 2300 days or years, and God says, you know what? I'm going to help you. In Daniel 924, notice what it says. Seventy weeks are determined or cut upon thy people, cut off, and upon the holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for in iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. So now, the first question that I would have if I were Daniel is, when does this 2300 years start? And so here the, the angel says to him, 70 weeks are determined or cut off upon thy people. And notice what it says in verse 25. So in answer to Daniel's question about the 2300, the, the uh, heavenly being says 70 weeks are determined. Now notice this, speaking about how God cares for Daniel and his people. In verse 25 it says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the Prince, shall be seven weeks, three score, and two weeks. The streets shall be rebuilt again, and the wall, even in troublous times. Now, the nice thing about this is that, remember, Daniel is troubled because he's anticipating his people getting out of slavery like the next day, really soon. And yet, this 2300 says otherwise. So God, in his caring mode, says, you know what, Daniel, I'm going to give you something to look forward to. What's he's got to look forward to? Inside of the 2300 year prophecy is Messiah the Prince coming. Amen? Amen. So the beauty of the 2300 day prophecy, I want, I want us to understand the beauty of it because we don't share it with others because we don't, we don't even know what the value is. So the beauty of the 2300 day prophecy is that it is intrinsically and inextricably connected to the cross event. From a technical standpoint, we'll look at that in a minute, but from a spiritual standpoint, Daniel said, okay, 2300, then the cleansing, all right, and God says, listen, 70 weeks from now, or from the going forth of the decree to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince. That's what Daniel's looking forward to, right? He's looking forward to Messiah the Prince. 
That's what they all were looking forward to is they were really students of the Bible and cared about the God of heaven. And he did. Verse 26. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, uh -oh, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end thereof shall be with the flood. And unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall, good news again, confirm the covenant, that's the Messiah, with many for one week. In the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation. And that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now, simply put, what's going on here is God is giving uh, enough of the vision and enough understanding about the 2300 days to... Daniel, the prophet, for him to feel more comfortable about his people's future. All right. They're not necessarily going to be enslaved forever. There is something tremendous to look forward to within the context of the 2300 day prophecy. Now, in the beginning of the 70 weeks is marked the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. We looked at Ezra 7 last week. We'll look at it again later today. But basically, Ezra 7 teaches us when that commandment to restore and build Jerusalem goes forth. So at that decree is the starting point of the 2300 day prophecy. And when did that take place? I'm asking you a question. All right, 457 BC, amen, With some students in here. In the Bible, only this decree is followed by thanksgiving, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, just trying to make sure there's nothing in my notes that I want to say here further. And there's not. Praise the Lord. So let's take a look at this picture here. You've got the 70 weeks, right? And here's here's the simple thing. There's basically one time prophecy in Daniel, and it's the 2300 evening mornings. Within that time prophecy are several others, but they're all contained within the 2300. So if you understand the 2300, you will understand the storyline of the 1260, of the 1335, of the 1290, of the 70 weeks. Okay? You'll understand the whole storyline because they're all encapsulated in the 2300 day prophecy. So, if we understand that the start date is 457, notice the, the graphic that we have up here. The 70 weeks is uh, comes to comes to pass or we've got 69 weeks first of all comes to pass when Christ or Yeshua becomes the Messiah or when he is anointed Christ or Messiah means anointed one when was he anointed at his baptism the Holy Spirit who's you know the anointing oil comes down in the form of a dove this is my beloved son in whom I well please that's the that's the technically a holding an anchor to know when the prophecy starts and thereby when it ends. Now, I want you to understand this. Some people are arguing about what well, the dates so or it should be 455 to start and all kinds of stuff that's there. But God not only gave the decree of Artaxerxes, which we now, in fact, I should, I should mention this. Recently in San Francisco, one of the museums there, a friend of mine, a pastor friend, was telling me that they had a, an exhibit, and he sent me some pictures too. I should have uh, put that in the presentation. But they had an exhibit of a stella. I believe that's like a, it's a document. I think it's in stone. Okay. And a stella of Artaxerxes in this decree in Daniel chapter 7. And so it's written in stone when the thing took place. But still, j just for the, the sake of the so called erudites that want to argue against the 2300 day prophecy you understand people come from different angles to argue against the judgment the cleansing of the sanctuary happening in 1844 amen you understand that and they come from many different angles and so the devil has tried to cause confusion but God in his foresight says listen I'm going to make the 2300 year prophecy as sure and as certain as my son's death can you say amen that's the point that I'm trying, trying to bring out here. And you can see by the graphic that the cross is in the very center in the thick of things here in the 2300. And I'm not going to go through all of the details here, checking my notes again, so make sure there's nothing that I missed that I do want to bring out. And I really don't think so at this point. We're going to come back to some of this uh, later on when we get into this week's study. 
about our prophetic message. But just look at the beautiful image there where Christ being cut off is very much in the center of the whole 2300 evening mornings. OK, now something I should mention about this. Oops. Something I should mention about the 2300 days is that uh, I don't want to. I showed you this last week, so I'm going to skip over this. Uh, and I'm going to go down to, I'm going to skip over this too. Okay. I'm going to skip over this too. This slide is just showing you that the 2300, in fact, I will stop here. Hang on a second. The, this, this slide, let me back up, make sure I didn't miss anything in the previous slide. This slide is just showing you that the start of the vision is Media Persia, okay? You remember in Daniel 8, verse 20, there's the what? What kind of animal is there? What's in Daniel 8, 20? What's the animal there? A ram, right? Is that right? A ram, and the ram represents Media Persia, okay? And so we know Media Persia reigned from 539 to 311, I believe it was. And so, we know that the 2300-day prophecy at least began somewhere between 539 and 311. But it'd be nice to know more specifically. And this is where Ezra 7 comes in. We understand it's actually 457 to be more precise. And by the way, it's in the fall <laughs> uh, of 457. Somebody should say amen to that. All right, so... Uh, the 2300 days must cover all the events depicted in Daniel 8, then that vision, media Persia, Greece, the activity, etc. And so it must not be 2300 literal days, etc. Uh, 70 weeks of Daniel 9 should start sometime in the Persian period, since according to Ezra and Nehemiah, it was under one or another of the Persian kings that the reconstruction of the city of Jerusalem began. Messiah comes in the 69th week. Hence, the prophecy is fixed with the Persian and Roman ruling periods, okay? And more precisely, fixed on what they did to Messiah, the prince. Now, something to point out here, uh, and then we can get into this week's study. And that is the Hazon. If you look at Daniel chapter 8 in the Mara, Daniel chapter 8 and uh, in verse, let me take a look here. I think we want to start in verse number one. The third year of the king Belshazzar, a vision appeared unto me. Now, when you say appeared, what does that insinuate? When I use the word appeared, it, it insinuates sight, doesn't it? And this particular verse is telling us that a vision that he could see took place. Okay? Now look at verse 26. Okay? Look at verse 26. The Bible says in Daniel 8, 26, that the vision of the evening and morning, which was told is true, wherefore shut up thou the vision, for it shall be for many days. Now, we would generally think that a vision here would be again referring to what was seen. But if we back up a little bit in Daniel 24 to verse uh, number 16, because remember in verse 26 is speaking of the vision of the what? Evening morning. You see that? And the vision of the evening morning was the 2300 evening mornings or day prophecy. And some people will find this interesting, folks, if you don't, don't worry about it. OK, but it, it just for some people, this is going to be helpful. In verse 16, the Bible says, and I heard you see that word? Now, when you say heard, what does that imply? It's audible, right? It's something you can listen to. It says, and I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make the, this man to understand the what? This vision. So in verse, coming back to verse 26 again, the original word there is actually not hazon, which is the first part of, of Daniel chapter 8, verse 1 which is what you see, but this is an audible. It's what he heard. So in particular, the heavenly being wanted Daniel to understand what he heard. Are you with me? All right, praise God. And what did he hear? After, after that, uh, what he heard, 
he, this man came near to stand to him. And this is in the context of the 2300 day prophecy and the cleansing. Sorry, coming back to 814. That's the context there, 13 and 14. And the cleansing of the sanctuary is what the heavenly being really wanted Daniel to understand. Are, are you with me? Does that make sense? Okay, praise the Lord. So the, just, you know, for all of our benefits, the key point in Daniel chapter 8 is not the daily, whether it's paganism or whether it's something else. It's not that. The key point of Daniel chapter 8 is that this is a sanctuary context and the sanctuary needs to be cleansed. And God of heaven, Palamoni, the wonderful number, wants Daniel and everyone after him to really understand about this 2300 days and the cleansing of the sanctuary specifically. Okay. That's the key, the cleansing. Now, if I were to jump back to you, you remember, I'm not going to jump back to it, but you remember the graphic that I showed a moment ago, right? With the cross being in the middle. Now, the cross is critical, wouldn't you say, to salvation. But something else is critical to salvation. And that's the cleansing of the sanctuary. When you teach I want you to understand, when you're teaching somebody else, this message, you must let them know that the 2300 days at the end of it, cleansing is just as important as the cutting off of Messiah, the prince. This is what most of Christendom does not know. A good question to ask someone if you're studying with them or you want to study with them and they don't they are not familiar with this or they don't believe it is what has Christ been doing since he's gone to heaven? Most Christians can't tell you what Christ has been doing, but they call themselves Christians. Christians means follower of Christ. Well, if you're following Christ, don't you know what he's doing? So therefore, this vision, friends, is a salvational gift from God. <laughs> and not only because Messiah the Prince is cut off, but because Messiah the Prince becomes the high priest. Hebrews chapter 8 and 9, who cleanses the sanctuary? Amen. What does cleansing mean? Cleansing is tied, say it? Restore, it, yes, restore. Cleansing is, is, is specific. Some Bibles do say restore in Daniel 8, 14, and that's fine. There's some restoration that takes place. Huh? Purify. On the Day of Atonement, isn't this what this is talking about? The cleansing of the sanctuary was tied up with judgment. You with me? It was tied up with judgment, friends. And so the day of atonement has to do, I'm sorry, the cleansing of the sanctuary has to do with the day of atonement is on the day of atonement. And the day of atonement has to do with judgment. So the people, by the way, Daniel means what? Anybody know what Daniel means? God is my judge. And so the people of Daniel's, uh, of Moses' time, the Israelites recognized that on the Day of Atonement, this was it, right? This was it. Judgment Day. And so now we come into, uh, my screen went off here, but now we come into today's lesson, which is our prophetic message. Our prophetic message. And as I'm trying to reconnect here, let's turn to Revelation chapter 14. I want you to see the smooth transition from Daniel chapter 8, 14. The 2300 day prophecy, which is dealing with the cleansing of the sanctuary. Which is about judgment. And Revelation 14, because see, God showed Daniel the time. But he shows John the message for the time. And so the question for us is, what time is it? And let me see if I can get to. Oh, hang on a second. I think that's what's going on. Revelation chapter 14, and we all should uh, be very familiar with this. And I'm sure we are. Yeah, cut off. This, this, is, this slide here is just showing us that, uh, that that word 
determined in Daniel 9:24 is is actually amputated. And so the question would be amputated or cut off from what? The answer would be from the 2300. Okay. But let me close this particular session out so that we can get into yeah. So that we can get into this today's lesson. So while while I'm doing this, are there any comments or questions so far? Okay, that was, we understand what was going on there, right? The cleansing of the sanctuary. And so now, Revelation 14. In Revelation 14, there are Generally speaking, people feel like there's three scenes, and those are the most natural, that's the most natural way to look at it. Does anybody know what the first part of Revelation 14 is dealing with? Hundred forty-four thousand. This hundred forty-four thousand is given a description here, and it's an interesting description. We don't have time to go into it. But, you know, they're without fault, they have no guile, they follow the land wherever they go. It's the direct opposite <laughs> of the people that are describing the, the book of Jude. And you guys, you may be thinking of something else. Now, there's, you know, there's two groups of people in the world, so one is directly opposed to the other. At any rate, the people in chapter 14, the first part, are a pure people. This has never happened in the history of the world since Adam and Eve have fallen. So that's who's described first. So the Bible gives you a picture of these saints that are living, and they'll be living at the time when Christ returns, that are just holy, I mean just perfect, a group. And they're referred to as 144,000. Then in the last part of Revelation 14, what's talked about there? It's the, it's the second coming, the harvest, right? And so the harvest is talked about. And this harvest has a connection between the previous chapter in Revelation 13, because in Revelation 13, there's this, uh, this battle going on, and there are those who are going to choose against God intentionally and harm God's people. So this harvest does not include those folks. There is a harvest for them, but in Matthew 13, the Bible tells us that the wheat and the tares are, are growing together, but then they are separated at the harvest. The harvest, Jesus says, is the end of the what? The end of the world. Amen. And so there are, in, in Revelation 14, three different parts of it. One tells you the end of those who were, have decided to be separate from God, and the reason they're separate from God is because they never separated from their sins. If you don't separate from your sins on the Day of Atonement, you're cut off from the camp. You follow me? Is that simple enough? And now God, in the middle of the chapter, reveals to John how the people in the first part of Revelation 14 get to being like they are. How it is that they are holy. How it is that they're living in this time where the mark of the beast in the previous chapter is being delivered and they're being threatened to death. There's a death decree that goes forward. And yet these people are standing without fault before the throne of God. So let's take a look at this. Is, would you say that's an important message? Amen. Let's take a look at Revelation 14. I can't understand why some people think we should not be reading Revelation or this particular uh, part of Revelation. That makes no sense. Okay. Hmm. Okay, Lord, so what's going on here? All right. I don't know why. I've got a messed up setting here or something, so let's keep, let's keep going. Uh, I want to start off with knowing the time, okay? So you see here in 1 Chronicles, 1 Chronicles, oh, there, that sort of works, but now I can't see. So 1 Chronicles chapter 12, 32, 
you can see that the Bible teaches us <coughs> about knowing the time. The children of Issachar, the Bible says, had an understanding of the time, right? Not only did the children of Issachar had an understanding of the times, you may not be able to see this. Can you guys see that? It's a little small and dark, huh? Okay. Children of Issachar had understanding of the times in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, 32 to know what Israel ought to do. If you understand the time, you know what you ought to do. In volume 6 of the Testimonies, page 24, it says that if it is the very essence of all right faith to do the right thing at the right time. He prepares a way for the, his work to be accomplished. God prepares a way for his work to be accomplished, but it's on us to do what the right thing is at the right time. We're moving through this quickly. Romans 13, 11, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is the salvation nearer than when we first believed. That's a powerful verse. And then at the end here, I have a repetition of Daniel 8, 17, which basically says, For at the time of the end shall be the vision. So sometime after, if we look at uh, Daniel 12, 1 through 4, we will see that the time of the end is at the end of the persecution of Christ's saints by the little horn power. You all with me? That took place, that ended in 1798. After 1798, you're living in the time of the end. How many people are excited about living in the time of the end? It's really cool, actually. All right, let's move on. It is. There's, you, do you realize Daniel would have paid anything to live in our time, friends? He would have done anything. So uh, I do want to, yeah, I'm, I'm not going to get into that. You guys can take down the notes there if you want. Uh, you're in Revelation chapter 14. I'm coming there with you shortly. Just want to go over this note real quick, which says, Daniel 8, 14, he said unto me, 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Some of you will recognize this picture of Hiram Edson, who was shown a vision after the great disappointment, Revelation 10, right? Sweet in their mouth, bitter in their stomach. He was shown a vision saying, wait a minute, the cleansing of the sanctuary you were right about but you didn't recognize what that meant. They thought it meant what? That the whole world would be cleansed. They thought the whole world was the sanctuary, therefore the whole world would be cleansed. Christ did his ministry on earth, the courtyard ministry. By the way, some people say, wait a minute, Jesus ate fish, Brother Charles. So then how come you saying I shouldn't eat meat? Well, friends, you got to understand <laughs> that when Christ was here on earth, he was doing the work of the courtyard. And sometimes the priest had to eat some meat. Why? To take sin upon himself. Right? Huh? What do you say? What? <laughs> uh, so, the, I, don't, I don't know about that, but... Well, and again, and again, it's, he had to fulfill all of the types of the sanctuary. So when he was here, that's why he did that. You think he eating fish in heaven right now? And as we move with him throughout the different phases of the sanctuary, in the holy place, there was no flesh food. And so today, friends, we shouldn't be doing that either. OK, coming back to this, you can see the 2300 years, 1844, the judgment takes place. All right. The judgment takes place. This is, this is important. The judgment takes place. Now notice this. Leviticus 16.30 says, And he shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle. Now, spend a, just a moment on this. Again, the cross event, very important. Because when he dies, our sins is, are transferred to the Lamb. But then as he goes to heaven in the first compartment, he sprinkles, as it were, his blood, his own blood that contains the record of our sin upon the building, upon the tabernacle in heaven. So now the tabernacle in heaven is bloody. Now, that's not the way it needs to stay. So therefore, an atonement has to be made for the sanctuary itself. That is equally important as the death of the Lamb. Are you with me? 
So here, that's where we are in history right now. We're in the, in the time where Christ himself is making an atonement for the sanctuary. In other words, he's trying to cleanse the sanctuary. Coming back to this idea of time. I know you're in Revelation 14. I'm coming. Galatians 4, 4. But when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman. I'm trying to point out to you how important time is to God. Very specific. John 7, 6. Then Jesus said unto them, my time is not yet come. 7, 8. Go ye up to the feast. I go not up yet unto the feast, for my time is not yet come. This is the account I refer to a lot of times where the, his brothers were saying, hey, let's go up to the temple. And he doesn't go. And it's like then the next scene is you see his brothers in the temple. And then right after that, here's Christ. It's like, why didn't you go with your brothers? Because his specific time had not yet come. But notice God is even more particular than that. John 2, verse 4, mine hour. This is when he turned the water into wine. He says, says to his, wife, his mother, woman, what hast thou to do with me? Mine hour is not yet come. Mine hour is not yet come. Notice how specific God is. John 12, 23, and Jesus answered them saying, the hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. This is when he recognized it was time for him to be cut off. Matthew, in other words, Christ was a student of Daniel. <laughs> he was a student of the prophecies of Daniel. Matthew 26, 18, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover. Friends, it's important for us to know the time that we live in. Amen. Take a look at what the Bible says here. Uh, comparing Daniel 7, we're setting the stage for Revelation 14, comparing Daniel 7 to Revelation 13. He shall speak great words against the Most High, Daniel 7, 25. Revelation 13 says, speaking great things and blasphemies. In 7, 21, and the same horn made war with the saints. And it was given to him, in, Daniel, in Revelation 13, it was given to him to make war with the saints. In Daniel 7, 25, shall wear out the saints of the Most High. Revelation 13, 7, war with the saints and to overcome them. Wear them out and overcome, same thing. Uh, Daniel 7, 20, more stout than his fellows. That horn was more stout than his fellows. Revelation 13, 7, power was given him over all kindreds, tongue, and people. His power, his kingdom was stronger than the others. Daniel 7, 25, they shall be given into his hand for a time, times of the dividing of times. That's the 1260. That's just inside of the 2300. Power in Revelation 13, 5 was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. That's the same as 1260 days. Would you say this is the same power? The little horn, we're told, is the papacy. We don't have to be told, but history vets it out that it's the papacy. And here in Revelation, we see the same thing. The beast from the sea is none other than the papacy, friends. And I'm going to tell you, the papacy is busy today. You want to say that this uh, individual that's in office right now is nice and kind? That's what he wants us to believe, friends. Remember, Satan is going to impersonate Christ. He's going to appear very nice. All right, let's keep going. Revelation 14 now. Verse 6 is our memory verse. How many of you memorize your memory verse? <laughs> Hopefully everybody memorized this one. Revelation 14, verse 6 says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every t nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Uh, worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of water. Very interesting. So the three angels' messages of Revelation 14 first sounded during the time of the 1830s to 1840s. Why? It's the judgment hour message. So you wouldn't expect that message to be said until the judgment hour, until the cleansing of the sanctuary. Are you with me? Until the 1840s. They will preach more fully, they will be preached more fully, the three angels' messages, as we get closer and closer to the day. Um, the main concern of Revelation 12 through 14 is the identification of God's people in the three angels' messages, it's identifying how those people become the way that they are, how they become holy, just, and good, as the Lamb is, or the high priest. Now, question could be asked. There are different ways, there are different pieces to this first angel's message. One is to fear God. Let me check my time. 
Mm, mercy. One is to fear God. The question is, what does fear God mean? If you read, I, if, if you can't take these down, is if anybody wants the presentation, you can have it, okay? But take the notes down. But the fear of God, if you look in Proverbs 8.13, I'll just give you one of these verses. It says, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Mm. Glorify him is another part of this prophecy. Glorify him. Colossians 1.27 uh, I don't recall it offhand, and I should. Does anybody remember what Colossians 1.27 says? That's the one. Uh, Christ in you, the hope of glory. I believe that's, that's it. Christ in you, the hope of glory. You have to check me on that. Colossians 1.27, but I know I have that one in here. Christ in you, the hope of glory. So Christ being within you, what does it mean to glorify him? What does that first angel mean when he says glorify him? It means have Christ in you. Christ in you, the hope of glory. And then it says, worship him that made. We understand in Genesis chapter one that God made the heavens and the earth. And the making of the heaven and the earth was capstone by the seventh day. We have the six days of creation and then the seventh day was what was set apart from that six days. It was cut off, if you will. And then we have the announcement of the judgment hour. And when we look at the announcement of the judgment hour, we can see in uh, Daniel 8:14, Revelation 3:14, uh, where we're looking at the Laodiceans. Though that means the people of the judge. In other words, the final church, the seventh church of the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, that Laodicean church, are called the people of the judge. So all of this is lining up perfectly. It's the judgment hour message given to the people of the judge, and they are supposed to give it to the world. Now, why are they supposed to give it to the world? Well, the hour of his judgment has come. They are supposed to announce that the Son of God is to be glorified. Let's run through the second angel's message. Any comments here so far? Oh, mercy. I mean, let me read a little bit of this. Those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, behold, your God, the last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world is a revelation of his character of what? Of love. The children of God are to manifest his glory in this in their own life and character. They are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. Mercy. Acts 319. So the question again was, what is why is this the message for this time? And you can see why. Acts 3.19. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be what? Blotted out. That's the day of atonement speech. That your sins may be expunged. When the times of what? Refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord and he shall send who? Jesus, which before was preached. Friends, if you ever want to know the final sequence of events, just study this text out. Look. Repent ye, A, be converted, B, that's the work of the Holy Spirit, that your sins may be what? Blot out. That's Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, specifically in the most holy place. Amen? That's what has to happen. These, the, these are the last scenes, just in Acts. When the times of what? What is that? What's the times of refreshing? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. It's, do you know what the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is? It's the preaching of the amplified preaching of the second and third angel's message found in Revelation 18. Daniel 11, 45, uh, 44. <laughs> Mercy. And he shall do what? Sin. Sin Jesus. Wow. So as the times of refreshing comes, after Christ in the heavenly sanctuary blots out sin, hmm? After you have been converted, after you have requested forgiveness and you have repented, turning away from sin, that's when Christ comes. That's what we find out from this. I can't even go on with the machine. Let's take a look at the second angel's messages, message in Revelation 14. I just love this message because it's so juicy. It gives us so much uh, positive news and also is so, so accurate and reflective and sincere of the time that we live in today, even with the negative connotations of it. 
Notice verse number 8, Revelation 14, 8. The Bible says, and there followed another angel saying, notice this, this angel is just saying. The first angel's message is saying with a loud voice, and so is the third, and so is the fourth. But this angel is just saying. I'm just saying. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is what? Is fallen and is what? Fallen. Apparently he's fallen twice. That great city because she made all nations do what? Drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And then I want to just go into the third angel's message. It says, there followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worship the beast and his image and receive the mark in his hand or in his, for his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of the torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints, they that keep the commandments of God, the faith of Jesus. Why is the, why is the danger or the, the execution of the judgment, if you will, in, verse, in the uh, third angel's message so severe? Why is it so severe? Tormented with fire and brimstone. Why is it so severe? Revelation 17, 6. Let me let you listen to this. That's right, but what, it's okay, so they worship the beast and his angel. So just let them do that. Why is it so fierce? But you're right, sister, that's a big deal. Worshiping the beast and his, his image is a big deal. But notice Revelation 17, 6, it says, And I saw a woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. Friends, this beast, is a power, or this Babylon, is a power, but the power is composed of people. And when you're looking at Revelation 13, there is a death decree. Daniel 11, planting the tabernacles in the place of his palace. There is a death decree that takes place against the people of God merely because they're sealed. They have the seal of God. And so how long, Revelation 6 or 4, uh, Lord, until you avenge our blood? Are you with me? Daniel's thinking, he's praying, oh, Lord, I didn't get to the prayer. Please study Daniel 9, the prayer, the first part of Daniel. And please study Ezra in Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 5 through 11, the prayer. When these men prayed and they included themselves in the sins of their people, that's when God was quick to answer and send forth the blessings from on high. And friends, we ought to be doing the same thing today. Don't be looking at people around you. Oh, he's not doing this. He's not. And we should be organized. We should be in unison. Nehemiah, when he went up to build, you know, he gathered people together and everybody was apparently on one accord. And that man was able to lead them folks out there. And they were all working. We have so many. They were all working towards the same goal. We have so many different ministries today. And it's almost like you do your thing over there. I'll do my thing over here. And I'll catch up with you later. No. <laughs> we should be walking in unison, friends. Because that, that little horn don't care nothing about us. That beast from the earth don't care nothing about us until we make some noise. Until we bring tidings from the east and from the north. Amen. When that third angel's message goes forth with the power of the heavenly being in Revelation 18, enlightens the entire earth with his glory. And that's what troubles that little horn power in Daniel chapter 11. And he says, wait a minute, I got to start killing folk. And we know what happens when the devil works through the papacy to kill folks. Do you know what happens? It's, the, it's been done before. You know what happens? He just plays himself, friends. Right? Isn't that what happened? Because all these different, I mean, folks were just like, you know, our blood is seed, is, was the, the comment of the day. As soon as they killed one, ten, other came, ten others came up. You can't, the devil cannot kill us, friends. And in, Revelation, in Daniel 12, verses one, verse 1, what does it say? At that time. Let's, look, let's close with that. Daniel chapter 12. If, and friends, I, I really just skipped over a whole lot of good stuff. Really, I did. Anybody's interested in talking about it later, please, you know, let me know. But let's close with Daniel chapter 12, verse 1. <laughs> now, in chapter, in chapter 11, 44 and 45, the previous text, 
That's the death decree or the Sunday law. Okay. Now, in 12.1, it says, and at that time, what time? After the death decree, evidently, right? Mikael uh, stand up. Shall Mikael stand up? The great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. Amen. Listen, God's people are being persecuted again. Fierce because they're teaching and standing for God. Because they're defending the character of Christ. And they're getting killed for that. And Jesus said, mm -mm, that's it. And he stands up. Look at what happens. Stand it for the children of thy people. I like that. God stands for you, his child. And there shall be a time of what? Okay, so what time does he stand up? He stands up after the three angels' message go forth with power, troubles the king of the north, which is the papacy, and the papacy causes a death decree after that time and before the time of trouble, just before the time of trouble. That's when Michael stands up. What's the big deal about Michael standing up? That's it. Close of probation. He that is holy, let him be holy still. He that is filthy, be filthy still. Let's continue. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never such as never was since there was a nation even to the same time. And at that time, thy people shall be what? Delivered. Everyone that shall be found written in the book. Friends, listen to me. The reason you need to know this message, our prophetic message, is because everyone in the world is in dire need of sincere intellectual hope with an emotional component. And the only pl the, the place where it's found in completeness is in our prophetic message. You can't, I mean, people sincerely, I mean, if Christ finished it at the cross, what are we doing here? You've got to bring in the cleansing of the sanctuary for people to have an intelligent understanding of what in the world is going on. What are we doing here? And what is God's, re what is our response to God's work? We don't even, most people don't even know what God's work is right now. What's Christ doing? I don't know. They never even thought about it. You have the message. Please, friends, as we stand for prayer, please share this message with everyone. Amen? Let's, let's stand for prayer. And we've got to run because our next group is coming. Oh, Father in heaven, Lord, thank you so much for your sanctuary message. And Father, we know the sanctuary message came under the first and se second angel's message. But Lord, beyond that, you have given us the judgment hour message. And Lord, we just thank you for that as well. Because it's a promise to us that Michael shall stand up and deliver his people. And we thank you so much for that, dear Lord. In his name, amen. Happy Sabbath. <laughs>